Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the January 19th, 2022 Town of Norfolk Zoning, Zoning Board of Appeals meeting. Um, in accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 30A, Section 20, notice is hereby given that the ZBA of Appeals is meeting tonight, Wednesday, January 19th, 2022, at 7 p.m. Um, please be advised this meeting will be audio and video recorded for future rebroadcast by Norfolk Community Television. Before we do roll call attendance, just one quick reminder to the board. Um, so fellow board members tonight, just a reminder since we're on Zoom, haven't done it for a little while, just remember that the, the cameras have to be on, your cameras have to be on while you're, when you're speaking and voting. So just be aware of that. Thank you. Elaine, would you mind doing a roll call vote for us, please? A roll call attendance, please. Sure, no problem. Um, Tim Martin. Present. David Axberg. Present. <clears throat> Chris Metcalf. Present. Josephine Carday. Josephine. Josephine. Yeah, we see you. Yeah. I think she's muted. Yeah. She just she left. Just logged off. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So if she rejoins us, we'll acknowledge her at that time. Okay. Um, and it looks like that is. We do have Courtney there. I see her. Oh, and Courtney. Yep. Present. Hang on. Courtney Starling. Did Joe good. leave? Thank you. He's doing the styling. <laughs> okay. So, let's see. All right. So, so the hour being 7 11, we had a 7, seven o'clock scheduled hearing for an application on 5 Hanover Street, wow. which I understand the applicant has requested a continuance. Um, only what's our next? meeting date in February? Um, the next date is February 16th. February 16th. Would someone like to make a motion that we continue the five Hanover Street to February 16th at seven o'clock? I make a motion to extend that to February 16th. Is there a second? I'll no, second, second that. that. Okay. Is someone second. Good. Any discussion? All those in favor? Say we need a roll call vote. Roll call. Yep. Okay. Um, Courtney okay. Starling. No, if you want to go with the, um, if you want to go with the, the the regular members, not the associate members. Oh, sorry about that. Um, okay. Chris Metcalf. Yes. David Aye. Axberg. I. Tim Martin. I. Joe Sebastiano. Joe Sebastiano. I don't see him. Yeah. I don't see Joe. Nothing to Joe. Uh, well, Tim, we might have to go to the bullpen to Courtney here for the moment. Okay. <laughs> Let me see if um, they've entered again. Great to have and a bullpen. Neither of them have entered again. I don't know. Up, oh, Chris Metcalf is back. I didn't leave. No, oh, he didn't never there. left. No. <laughs> I'm the only one who didn't leave. I'm sorry. Come on, Chris. Yeah, I didn't. Well, leave. Wait a second, Josephine. Yeah, trying... you're right. You didn't leave either. <laughs> Josephine is trying to get in again. Okay, let's try this again with Josephine. There she is. Hi, Josephine. Jo is Josephine back? Yeah, she you gotta, is. she's gotta get off mute now. Hi, Josephine. I finally made it. Oh, I'm good. so sorry. That's okay. Jo Josephine, just to get you up to speed, we have a motion before the board. It's been motioned in second that we continue the hearing for 5 Hanover Street for a variance. So they continue that hearing to February 16th at seven o'clock. Okay. You in favor? Yes, yes. Say, Josephine, if you could state your name. Josephine Kodahi. And that's an to continue. Okay, great. 
Thank you. Um, Sorry, I was having technical difficulties. I wasn't able to get on. No, no worries. worries. Not quite 7.15, but we're awfully close now. Oh, we just got a moment. So looks like everybody's back on board. So no, no one move. <laughs> we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> just got a few seconds here. Then we'll uh, pick up on Pond Street and Sharon Ave, which I also will believe will be a continuance. Is uh, Joe in the waiting room, Elaine? Uh, no, he is not. Hmm. Okay. Lost Joe? The moment, yeah. Well, you can, uh, being 715, you can. Yeah, we can at least take care of this housekeeping matter. So the hour being 715, we, uh, this is regarding uh, an application on 90, 92, 96, 100, 100R, Pond Street and 12 Sharon Ave for special permits for a large scale ground mounted solar photovoltaic system. They've asked for a continuance um, to our next meeting, which is February 16th. We have a seven o'clock appointment. Why don't we move this one likewise from tonight to 7.15? Is there a motion to that effect? Can we get a motion to continue the hearing? I make a motion to continue the hearing to February 16th. Okay, and, and I'll second that. Any discussion? Roll call vote. Okay. David Axberg. Aye. Chris Metcalf. Aye. Josephine Corday. Aye. Okay. Tim Martin. Tim Martin, aye. <laughs> Tim Martin. <laughs> and we don't have Joe on board, but we have we have it. We have four. No, uh, David, no, he hasn't. Uh, oh, now Joe's coming in. Well, we could have Courtney vote. Joe just came out back in. All right, so. The Hang on. I'll ask him to unmute. Oh. <clears throat> Joe? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. We had a, uh, had a power problem. Okay. Okay, okay so, so just to get you up to speed, there's been a motion and a second to continue the hearing for Pond Street and 12 Sharon Ave to February 16th at 7.15. Um, okay. it's, been, it's been moved and seconded and we like it. We're asking you for your roll call vote on that. Sure, I agree. Aye. Thank you. So Elaine, before we go to the public hearing, can you make me co-host <laughs> that way I can... Uh... Sure thing. You should be all set. Okay. So, Joe, before we get started, Joe, do you have the public hearing notice for uh, 151 Union yes, Street? I, yes, I do. Okay. okay. All right. So, then we'll, I'll, I'll have wait to, a minute or two, and then we'll, I'll introduce that, Joe, and I'll ask you to read that into the record. Yeah. And again, sorry for my uh, power fail and reboot. No, that's it. Understood. So, uh, We'll get to it later on this evening. We have about a minute or two, but I just think that I, I uh, this afternoon, I was looking at some of the minutes for the December 15th meeting, and I had a couple of items that I went over with Elaine, and she made a couple of edits to it. So I don't know if that got recirculated, but we can go over the minor edits that were made to those minutes. I don't know if folks have had a chance to read them yet, but uh, later on tonight, we'll, we'll see if folks have, and if so, we'll We'll approve them at that time. But I just yeah. want to get you a heads up. There might have been some minutes gone out late in the day. Maybe they didn't go out. Yeah. Well, the version I read, I, I looked through it, but yes, it'd be interesting to know what you saw is needing to be edited. Okay. Well, and you didn't have a chance to circulate that to the group, did you? Those minutes? No, I did not. Okay, we'll go over it later on. Then I can I can flag what I. Sorry. If agree, we can just approve them as edited if we agree. Yeah. Just 
just waiting for a moment here to the 720. Okay, I have 720. So it being 720, I'd ask Joe to read into the record that the next notice for the 151 Union Street request for a special permit. Sure. Thank you. Notice here by given in accordance with chapter 48 of the Massachusetts General Laws and any and all amendments thereto that a public hearing will be held by the Zoning Board of Appeals, Norfolk Zoning Board of Appeals. On, in room 120, in, I guess via Zoom, at uh, on January 19th, 200, uh, 2022 at 7.20 p.m. for the following application. Jennifer and Mark Edwards for special permit in accordance with Norfolk Zoning Bylaws Section F4A to allow an enlargement of an existing non-conforming structure that does violate the setback requirements of Section E1B, but does not violate those requirements to a greater extent than the original structure. The property is located at 151 Union Street, in the R3 zoning district, reference assessors map 12, block 61, lot one. Thank you. So I don't know if, if uh, Jennifer or Mark Edwards are uh, available or if they're architects available this evening. Um, yes, um, Mark uh, Edwards is here and um, Nathaniel Cardin is here as well. Great, love to hear from either one of them or both. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for your time in the hearing. Um, I see that you're sharing the site plan, referencing the project. Uh, that's a great introduction, uh, kind of giving an overview. Um, this is in reference to 151 Union Street in Norfolk, as mentioned. Uh, the bylaws reference uh, that we're looking at here is section F4A, uh, just to briefly kind of reiterate, um, it's an enlargement of a non-conforming structure, uh, does violate the setback, the front setback on Union Street, uh, but not to a greater extent than the original structure. Um, and shown in the site plan here, you can see that the front porch is that greatest extent uh, at 12 foot or 12.2 feet. Uh, and the new addition that will be attaching to the existing colonial home is 14.2 feet. Um, so we're kind of keeping it receded behind that front porch, uh, farmer's porch style uh, point of, of reference. Um, and just kind of as another introduction to the project, um, the addition is for use by the family to support uh, independent living space for the owner's son, uh, who was formally diagnosed with autism in the year 2006. Uh, it's not for commercial purposes. It's not uh, for a two family use. It's a single family home uh, for use within the, the same single family. Uh, and the family is invested long term in the, the town of Norfolk and has no plans at this time to, to sell the home for a short term profit or anything of that, that nature. Um, the proposed design will not be detrimental or offensive to the neighborhood, uh, no nuisances uh, to the neighbors. And it doesn't pr produce any more like additional occupants or, or traffic uh, on the street. Um, here, thank you for transitioning to the architectural drawings. I was going to offer to share my screen, but you're <laughs> flowing through it just as I was uh, hoping to as well. So thank you. Um, this is the view from, uh, from Union Street, where you can see where we're proposing uh, the addition to this colonial style home. Uh, we've given it uh, sort of a, a nickname to the house, uh, the same different house. And the reason for that name uh, is, is because it can be at once of the same language, sort of a contemporary vernacular interpretation of the colonial style, uh, where we're continuing this rhythm of upper story windows in, in the extension. Uh, and there's a lot of street vegetation that uh, is sort of screening this, but it it does have some street presence, so that view is, is important. Uh, and here's the architectural site plan that showed, really highlights the two additions that are being uh, proposed, one being uh, conforming and the other non-conforming. Non uh, and there's a, a space between these two additions that we're calling uh, Zen Garden. And uh, that's an important feature of this space because uh, it's a consideration as far as just a comfortable design, which I think is important for people in general, but especially uh, when considering design for a person who has the added challenge of, of 
living with with autism. Um, that said, you know, having met David several times now, he's he's high functioning. He's doing doing very well. He's um, you know working, uh, but not necessarily ready to to leave the home. And um, at this point, um, yeah, we could keep keep moving through the the drawings. Um, this shows kind of the the layout of the spaces where we're connecting to the existing home uh, with the sunroom and then opening up uh, to sort of a larger volume. Yeah, you could go to the second floor uh, plan. That'd be that'd be great. Um, a key consideration in this drawing is that we don't necessarily want to block daylight and views from the second story of the existing house. So we're connecting the roof to that existing farmer's porch. And then there's a space on, in the loft bedroom that creates kind of a quiet corner uh, that looks out to, to nature. This drawing is followed by the, the elevations here uh, where we're following the match, matching the pitch of the existing home in, with the roof line uh, and allowing some, some breathing room uh, in between. Yep, can keep keep moving through these. Um, there's a large, that large window there that looks from the living space, uh, the living extension into, uh, into the Zen garden. And uh, what that, what this low recreation room space does allows the rest of the home to maintain its, its views to the backyard uh, with minimal impact to windows, that sort of thing. This view is from the other way on Union Street. Uh, there is a large maple tree that would actually, you know, be screening a large portion of, of this view. Um, we intend to retain that, that tree, uh, but this just kind of shows how it all kind of uh, comes together. Uh, and a, a look inside the space uh, with that, that volume and view to nature. And then a, just a, a brief overview of the recreation room in the back, which just is for family activities. Uh, family has a lot of hobbies, <laughs> and uh, this is where they would they would get together for their uh, games and collectibles and uh, for, with friends and family. And just another another look inside that that space there, uh, and the deck extension to the left. I think there's one more interior view of, of that space just to kind of give a holistic uh, view of the of the design and, and the project. Um, and as an effort, just to kind of summarize where we've come to, to date, we've had a civil engineer brought on board. Um, they've helped us with the, with the survey and they've looked at the septic system and we've determined that the septic system will need to be uh, replaced. So um, we're making preparations and uh, humbly seeking permission to move forward with the project. I'd love to answer any questions that folks might have. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Nathaniel. I'll open it up to the board and, and the public in a moment, but thank you for the presentation and just a couple of comments and just to the direction for the board. The, um, first of all, your, your, your client's property, I grabbed by, it's a beautiful property. I'm, I'm happy to see that they're going to, extend the house here and, and stay in Norfolk and accommodate their family. It's wonderful. It's an intriguing design. Um, just for the board, it, it looks like this, the, the request for the special permit is really due to the, the front yard setback. Obviously, the, the parcel is over six acres. Side yard is in conformity. Rear yard's in conformity. Lot coverage is, appears to be well in conformity. So it's really the front yard setback, I believe, is the only issue. And I do believe under FA4 that they would be, they, they do meet the requirements of that to go under a special permit request. Um, and it's gonna remain as a single family. Um, I think that outlines what we're tasked to look at. So I'll, that being said, I'll, I'll open it up, up to the board members for comments and questions. Okay, I'll, I'll start Tim, Joe Sebastiano. Go right ahead Joe, thank you. Yeah, okay. All right, so I can see from the, can we look at the overhead rendering of this again, just to kind of see the two extensions again? Yeah, 
Is that one okay there to the right? Yeah, that, that's okay. That one at the right is fine enough. I see that. Okay, good. All right. So just to confirm, the, the, we're extending the structure with two different separate kind of breakouts. They're still attached to the house, correct? Correct. And the one towards the back is the recreational space. It's like one big room. It's not multiple rooms. Uh, there's a powder room, like a, a small bathroom. Right, right, right. Uh, right. But one, and, mainly one large room, correct. And then the other extension that's along Union Street, that's going to be two stories, right? Yes. Uh, is, that, is that an additional bedroom also? There is an additional bedroom, yes. So yeah, we're taking that into consideration with the, right. the septic design. Is that on the second floor? Or is the first floor? Like, what, describe the first and second floor one more time. Mm -hmm. that. It's kind of a story and a half type of design um, where basically there, there's an entire ground floor and then a half story above uh, where you can see the, the stair going up and there's uh, an open space to, to below um, so that the bedroom is kind of like a, a loft and it has uh, two dormers that help to uh, amplify the, the headroom. So technically you're increasing the home by, I guess, two rooms or two and a half rooms or? Um, there's the recreation room, um, a large room. Room extension and then, and then the loft space. So I, I think you could consider it three rooms. Okay, so is there one additional powder room bathroom to the house? There's um, two powder rooms and a bathroom being proposed. Okay, and I, obviously you, you talked about the septic. Yeah. Okay, so what's the total square foot being increased? There's, uh, let's see. Sorry, there's, a, there's a summary, if you don't mind going to that on the, on the first page. Uh, that'd be great. Here we go. Yep, right on, on this page here. Okay. Uh, okay so good. the existing house there is 3285 gross square feet to the outer face of the exterior wall. Um, yeah. And the proposed addition we're, we're looking at 1866 in added area for a total of uh, 5151 yeah. gross square feet. No, thank you. And I agree with Tim. It is a beautiful property. And uh, the, obviously, they're, they're going to have some uh, a significant increase in living space. But you know, it sounds like they're trying to stay within the guidelines minus the one fact that they have to need, they need a special perm permit for what they're trying to do here. So thank you. thank you. Any other board members or associate board members have any questions? Can you show us the first floor plan of the addition again? Uh, not the rec room, but the, uh, the, there we go. So this is connected by a sunroom. Yes. Okay, and it's got it's, and it's got a kitchen and a bathroom and a bedroom. Correct. It's kind of an open sleeping area in the loft above. Yes. Yes, and I'll actually uh, add one of those things. That's a good clarification that I wasn't quite picking up that there's an additional, there's a kitchen being added too, correct? Yes. Okay. So in most places, this would be an accessory unit. I'm I just say, I, like conceptually, I'm, I'm favorable. I'm just questioning the zoning because I don't, I don't, because we're here on a front yard setback, but this in the regulations, if this were a conversion, it would be capped at 800 square feet. I think it's a great thing to do. I, the regulations, I think, are. Uh, so in terms of the. How, the, how did building do this? So in terms of with just a brief background and the history of when they first came forward to the building department to review the project, there was no actual connection to the, this first front area addition. So the, the concern was raised with the same point that you're raising. So in terms of um, the sunroom makes that physical connection. Um, so there, it's just an addition off it. It's not, not a separate dwelling unit. So they were, they've reviewed I, it and they were fine with this. I point. mean, okay, all right, I'll go with it. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. 
Anybody else on the board or have any comments or questions and then we can open up to the public if anybody. I just had a, I had a, I just had a question okay. on observation rather. Hi, Josephine. Um, the, it's connecting to the sunroom, but, but that is what's causing it to protrude a little bit more forward onto Union Street than the existing structure is because it's connecting to the sunroom. Uh, I don't think it's extending for, I'll let the applicant address. I don't think it's coming any more closer to the, to the front. Um, I think it's about two feet back. Oh yeah, two back from the, oh yeah, I see from the porch. That's yeah. a covered porch. Is that a screened in porch? Uh, it's not screened uh, at this time. It's, it's a covered farmer's porch that wraps around the structure. Okay. Is there a, uh, another, uh, another source of egress for the living space to the left of the property? I don't see a back door. Are we talking from the existing house or from the new, the new, the new one on the left that's attaching to the, to the sunroom? Mm -hmm. Is there another egress or a, a, an exit? It exits through the sunroom to the, to the exterior. And how much is that square foot? It's, 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 it's 545 square feet. On the ground floor. Correct. Okay. And then up additional. Is there a, a fire exit or um, a fire stairway from the second floor? Directly to the outside, no, um, which is, uh, but there would be an egress window, which meets the uh, building code. An egress window on the first floor? Uh, on the first floor and second floor, there would be uh, egress window, windows to the exterior. That the would meet the requirement for the second floor, okay. No, it, it meets all of the egress requirements for the for the building code. Without a ladder or anything for the second floor, I'm not sure how that works. No, there, there wouldn't be a ladder uh, required for this uh, for this structure from the second floor or the first floor. Any other questions, comments from the board? If there are none, is there anybody in the waiting room from the public? So uh, Tim. They're, they're adding a kitchen. What happens when they're, when they're done and the house is then up for sale to somebody else? Is it a two family or is it a one family? Well, they have a, there's no change in use here. It's a single family. That's my understanding. They're only before us for a special permit, not for a change of use, just for a special permit relative to the setback from the front yard. So really that becomes a, 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 a zoning issue as far as but there's no change in use here. Okay. Um, it's still a single family and the change, you know, it, it, the change in use, what we're here for is a special permit for the, right. for the front yard setback. Right. Okay. Now, Tim, I had one more question. Um, this is Joe. Yeah. The, ahead, uh, Joe. Details on the sunroom, the sunroom connecting the extended, the extension to the, to the main house what is that what kind of structure is that is that a you know what kind of walls what kind of you know what kind of structure is that it'd be a wood frame structure on a wood concrete frame. footing foundation uh with a glass enclosure so uh if you go to the elevations but it's getting it's getting like new footing for that for that area correct yes the existing portion of the deck there would be removed uh, there'd be a new foundation to support those those mm -hmm. walls uh, and then uh, glazing installed with the doorways that provide access uh, between the spaces and to the outside. Okay, right. thank you. It has, has a is, is there a structure engineer on this project at all? I'm a licensed architect, um, uh, certified and capable of performing structural calculations. Um, and I also, uh, retain a structural engineer who is licensed and certified uh, in the state of Massachusetts. And is this being constructed or erected in a modular format or traditional framing? This would be traditional framing. Any, any questions from the board relative to the setback? Everyone's comfortable with that? That has enough information. I'll open it up to the public. Is there anybody in the waiting room? Hi, 
I don't see anyone having any questions. Okay. If there's no other questions, comments, or anybody in the waiting room, I'll entertain a motion to close the public hearing. Is there a motion? I, I, I don't hear anything. I'm sorry, I'll I make, make a motion. Make, go ahead, oh, make go a ahead. Go I ahead, make a motion that we close the hearing for 151 Union Street. Is there a second? I second it. Alain, could you help us with a roll call vote? Sure thing. Tim Martin? Aye. Joe Sebastiano? Aye. Christopher Metcalf? Aye. Josephine Carday? Aye. And Courtney Starling? She's not. Uh, she can't. She still can't. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. You got Christopher. Oh, Mike. and David Axberg. And David. Yeah. David. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Hi. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Thank you. Th thank, thank you, Nathaniel. Thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Edwards. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. So we'll try, if, if the boards will, if, the, if we have time tonight, um, we'll, we'll try to deliberate and have a decision and probably the decision wouldn't be issued until the next uh, hearing, but maybe the vote would take place this evening. Thank you. Okay, it's 7.40. Next on the agenda, uh, we have Boyd's Crossing. Um, tonight, I think we have two gentlemen who are going to join us, previous uh, ZBA board members who are going to help us out and I think get us a baseline on what lighting plans were approved, amended, and, or, and then subsequently were adopted or approved relative to the lighting plan for Boyd's Crossing. So I think we have Mr. Kaliza and or Mr. Wider available. I'd be happy to hear from either one. So I did see. Yeah. Good evening, Tim. Good evening, Tim. How are oh, you? Good. Yeah. good evening, Chris. Welcome. Thanks for having us. Uh, I think uh, the background you guys were looking for was Boy Boyd's Crossing was really the second 40B that the town of Norfolk had entertained. Meeting House Hill was the uh, first 40B and Boyd Crossing came after that. Um, for Boyd's Crossing, the town did not have legal counsel representing the board. And um, Rich can probably fill me in. I don't remember Judy's last name, but she was sort of the mother of 40B at the time, correct? Fair. Um, yep. Yes, back then. And so she was assigned to the board to assist us in this 40B. Uh, unlike following 40Bs where I think Joseph and Sebastiano was part of, I think Tim and Josie were both part of, was, you know, T Dan Hill would go through as we approached the end of the 40Bs and we would review the general bylaws of the town and review the zoning bylaws and cross-check what was being applied for, what the law was, and what was the variance that was being approved at the time. Uh, Boyd's Crossing, we never did that. Uh, Judy, pretty much presented to the board and it was actually more at that time was more an adversarial relationship with developers in that um, it was, you know, we don't want the number of units. We don't want uh, where it's going to be. Uh, there was a lot of talk about the main street and the fact that main street had just been repaved and trucks be going over main street. Uh, one of the big contentious issues was the 19 foot streets in that area. So there was a number of things that took center stage and, uh, Judy was a huge part of that. The board did not have as much input as we had as we went further in 40Bs, where we actually looked at landscape plans and really hammered down on them, looked at lighting plans and hammered down on them. And I think after this 40B was approved, uh, there was a lot of changes being made. One, we had talked extensively about the 19-foot streets, I remember. And another big issue was the lighting plan. And that came right on the heels of people complaining about Meeting House Hill looking like an airport. Uh, the lighting was just too intense. And Bob McGee weighed in very heavily at that point about shutting down lights up in Meeting House Hill. And we actually, subsequent after that, we actually took out lights. 
and um, how to re redo the sidewalk and remove lights. So post comprehensive permit, there was a lot of discussion still about Boyd's Crossing and the lighting plan over there. And um, if I remember, we had a second lighting plan submitted uh, from Bisher with a lot of input from Bob and others. And, uh, and I, at the time, I think it was Joseph Astriano, Mike Caliza, myself, Bob Luciano were the voting members at that time. I think um, uh, we had one more fellow on the board who I actually didn't participate. And uh, we reviewed the lighting plan that was put into the comprehensive plan. And through administrative approval, we allowed Bisher to change it. And uh, a lot of that had to do with input from, I think it was police, uh, not being concerned with overlighting it. Uh, Bob McGee's concerned of what he had seen over the years uh, with Meeting House Hill. And, uh, and I think also even the fire department weighed in heavily on it and neighborhood. There was, um, I think it's uh, Mr. Diamond is one of the neighbors who, he has, you know, there was a lot of issues because his property really abutted it on one end. I think he was the only abutter over there at the time, uh, what the lighting would be on his property. So, and I think that's where the subsequent or the second plan came into play. It was administratively approved by the board, but I guess there was some administrative foul up in that the comprehensive permit still showed the initial plan, even though in the same file was the subsequent plan submitted by the developer. I don't know if Mike can add anything to that, but that is uh, that's pretty much my remembrance back from then. Mike, you're muted. There he is. <laughs> okay. There we go. Okay. How's that? Hi, Mike. Tim, how are you? Good to see you. Chris, thank you. Yeah, I think Chris kind of captured the essence. Uh, I'll just add a little perspective. Over the past 17 years uh, that I've been on the board, um, we've handled 10 40B projects. The town is, uh, has 10 40B projects. This was one of the earlier projects that we did. And we learned a lot. Every project, every 40B we did, we got better and better and better at it. And this is one of the earlier ones. And this is prior to Dan Hill, who, who came on board. Dan Hill, if you don't know the name, is probably one of the best 40B attorneys in the state of Massachusetts. He represented the board and the town of Norfolk. And he didn't join us until after this project was finalized. And uh, so there were loose ends. Uh, again, we were learning. This is the second one we had done. Um, and I guess for the current board, the, the most important fact to know is that it's not unusual that after the comprehensive permit is signed, that administratively the board can vote and, and change things. We often did that, not only for lighting, landscaping. Uh, you know, there was a comprehensive permit is, uh, the project is so complicated, there's so many moving parts that even after the comprehensive permit is signed, details are worked out. And so this is a perfect example. This lighting plan was worked out afterwards uh, because we had strong input from Bob McGee, who was the DPW director. He insisted that there was too much lighting. He just had to go through the hassle of correcting the lighting on Town Hill. And so administratively, and as, as this new board does, it, you know, we, we're in a safe harbor now, so you probably won't have a 40B for a while, but you realize that these projects are big, they're complicated, lots of moving parts. And even after the comprehensive permit is signed, there are things that we clean up and, and tighten up on. And this lighting plan is a perfect example of that. What was originally in the comprehensive, which the, 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 the actual, the schematic in the comprehensive plan is not the final plan that the board approved, I think two or three months later. So what the town has agreed to is the plan that uh, was approved by the board, I think two or three months after the comprehensive permit was, was signed. So I just hope that gives them um, a little perspective. And if you have any questions, I'm sure Chris and I would be happy to answer them. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Chris. Just a question on the, uh, so when the, when the second plan came in on the lighting plan, did, did it come before the board or was it done kind of out in the field? and then came formally before the board, do you recall? Uh, it, it, didn't get into yeah. the final comprehensive permit as an amendment. It's, I'm just trying to see if the applicant brought it forward or if it was a... No, the, the, um, as you know, all the departments get to weigh in right. and Bob, Bob Begee asked that we meet uh, and, and uh, refine the lighting plan and reduce it. So there was a meeting uh, with um, uh, 
in the town planner's office uh, with members of the board. And then, so, and the applicant, we all agreed on what it should look like based on the input from police, DPW, fire, and that board, that plan went back to the board for discussion and it was approved by the full board. Okay, so it was approved by the full board. Okay. Right. Yes. It was approved as an administrative change, Tim. Okay. By the board. Yep. Okay. Any, any, so I, I guess tonight we're here because I, I assume that there's going to be some discussion between the developer and the residents out there. And maybe, maybe the residents want something different than what the developer is intending to build pursuant to that plan. I, I'm just guessing that. I don't know that to be the fact, but we'll find out. Um, so I, what I'll do is I'll open it up to the board members first and then to the public. Um, and, I, and hopefully I, I'd ask Chris and Mike to stick around as long as I can tonight. Yeah. It's beneficial uh, to have you on board tonight. Uh, and Mr. Chairman, if I can make one final point. I mean, the, uh, the plan that we approved, the applicant is... Um, has to build, you know, that's what he has to build too. If the residents want to make changes to that plan, they certainly can, but the applicant is not responsible for paying for those changes. If, if the condo association wants to, you know, go into their treasury and pay for these changes, you know, they, they certainly can do that, but it, it's not on the responsibility of the applicant to, um, uh, to, if they want to make changes, it's not his responsibility financially to make those changes. Yeah, I, I would agree. Any any plan that was that was approved, uh, the the bill that has the right to to to, to do that without, without any changes, regardless of what the residents prefer, unless they negotiate something else and come back for an approval. Yeah, um, exactly. Okay, so I'll open it up to the other board members if they have any questions now, or if we want to just go right to the anybody in the public. Uh, but I'll open it up to the board members and associate members first. Yeah, this is Joe Spastiano, and hi, uh, Mike and Chris. It's nice to see you guys. Hi, Joe. Um, the, uh, just to be clarified, the plan, just as a refresher, the plan that's in our email right now that was, you know, forwarded to us, that's the one that's tagged final, right? That's the one that's been approved. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, the one that has the June 16th uh, thing on it. No. Yeah, I just, oh, make sure, I just want to make sure I have the right document open, that's all. It's on the screen sharing right now. Okay. All right. All right. Very uh, okay. Because I, I saw a couple different things floating around. So this is the, this is the one that we're, we have tagged this file. This is the one that was approved by us a while back. This is, I can't read sideways. This is the subsequent lighting plan that was approved. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm trying to see the date. I just wanted to make sure because like I've seen a couple of different versions uh, floating around this week. It says June 1st, 2016. That's the one. Uh, yeah. Okay, very good. Yep, that looks like the one, Rich. I think you, you got it. So just a... Uh, I know you open up to the public quickly in terms of you know the research as I as we dug I dug in through the files I didn't have a a written approval to that effect and that's why hence you have the chair and the former vice chair here to explain at least what took place back in 2016. Um, I just I just want to interject before we um, talk to the public. Am I correct in assuming or uh, assessing that? this uh, final plan that was approved before, that we didn't see before now, uh, had less lighting than what is currently there? This plan has less lighting that was in the, the one you saw before that was part of the, the endorsed plan set. I see a difference, yes. Yeah. It's had it's less done. lighting. Yes. Okay. Rich, if you maybe you haven't had a chance to do it, but do you, do you know whether or not back in June or around that time when this plan got endorsed or approved, was are there minutes that show that there was just a meeting to address this 40B? I didn't, I didn't see them in the minutes, but I don't, it's not, it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't, well, it wouldn't have been noticed, so. No, I didn't, I no, that was part you of the. You have to find, you have to research several months. Yeah, and I didn't see it in the. 
So that's part of the so, well. That's that's the reason why you have a couple of members here, former members, because yep. I didn't, I couldn't find it through the records. Yeah. Okay. No, I'm just trying to get as much support or whatever is available. That's all. Thank you. Any other board members have any questions before we open it up to the public or associate members? Yeah, this is Christopher Metcalf. Uh, I just have one question. Uh, uh, you mentioned that the some of the input came from uh, you know from the police or the fire. It, it seems like a majority of the lighting here is is on the footpath in the center of the facility. Is is that what I'm seeing here? And are are all the lighting the same type? Are these stand lights, you know, tw uh, fifteen feet tall with a light on the top? Or is that is that what I'm we're expecting? It looks like there's not much lighting on some of the roadway. That's what I'm wondering. And the light seems to be concentrated on the footpaths, on the in interior of the uh, uh, of the development. Do you want to pull the plan up again? Sure. Sorry. So there's your lighting plan again, Chris. You'll, you'll see the uh, the key legend down below. It looks like the eight foot lights, down lights, and sconces. Is there an illumination plan that actually shows where the illumination right. is being cast? And it's something that shows the foot candles? It's hard to determine whether or not something is accurate or adequate based on dots, if it's not accurately reflecting the light that's being cast. Yeah, so the, not for this particular plan. There is. Um, to the applicant, was there ever, was that ever in the plan set? I know 2016 was a while ago, but it, was that ever done? There was a, I believe there was an original drawn up with the original set of uh, lighting plans when the reduction happened. I don't believe a new uh, illumination plan was was drawn up. Um, Excuse me. However, oh, just identify yourself with the record, please. Oh, sorry, Owen Kelly with the Powerhead. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so I don't believe another illumination plan was drawn up after the meeting with the boards and the police chief. And just so I understand, you are coming tonight to install the original lighting as proposed, as opposed to any for. Uh, negotiated lighting after the fact or is this another modification I'm just trying to understand based on yeah this isn't a modification where this one after the last time you were here no, right this is not a modification request okay so um, actually, is, yeah. okay so this, this is, is, a, this is a more of actually seems like an internal zba uh, discussion yeah so I, I think i think if i'm not mistaken um that we're trying to determine it and, and feel comfortable and, and formally recognize that this plan is the plan that was subsequently appropriately adopted by the by the ZBA. And I think that's what Mike and Chris are testifying to tonight. So we have them here, we have their recollection, we have their testimony on that. And I think that's what we're trying to establish first is that that's the plan that was adopted appropriately. And that's the plan that the developer can proceed on. Um, and, and I don't believe the developer is asking for any modifications. Okay. All right, I just wanted to understand because the last time they were in, um, there was a lot of discussion with the neighbors about changes and then. Yeah, we may hear it from the neighbors. The neighbors okay. may get back to the developer on, on something else, but I think we're just trying to get that baseline established okay. so we know. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. And, and Tim, do we know how much of the uh, agreed to lighting? I did have one. Go ahead. I was gonna say, Ms. Chairman, Joe. Go ahead, Joe. I just wanted to ask, do we know how much of the agreed to lighting has been installed? I don't know. Owen, do you? Do you? Have an answer for that? Can you help us out? Owen, oh, you're on mute. Sorry, one second. I'm doing a count here. Right. You are. I believe we have. Uh, there, there is still a significant amount of lights that need to be installed per this plan. Uh, the wiring, un underground wiring, for most of them is in. I believe there's five internal footpath lights and uh, all the parking spaces in the back need to be lighted as well as three corners of the subdivision need to be lighted. 
So I believe there's a total of 11 lights missing. So I, I'm, I'll, I'll open it up to the public in a moment, but I just want to caution the board and, and, and that I, I really don't want to open this up to a, uh, a negotiation tonight between the ZBA, the developer, and the residents. It's not that I'm not willing to participate in something like that, but I'm not sure that we're all there yet to, to, to do that effectively. I don't know, but we'll, we'll find out. If we, can, if we can get to a solution, I'm happy to participate, but I think right now I'll, I'll open it up to the public and see what their questions or comments are relative to recognizing this plan as the approved light plan first. So if there's anybody in the waiting room, we can hear from them. We can recognize, happy to recognize anybody in the waiting room. Okay. Um... Mr. Chairman, this is Michael Baskin. I'm a resident at Boyd's. Go right ahead, Boyd's Mike. Crossing Mike. And, <clears throat> and a member of the uh, uh, board of trust, the board of trustees for the uh, community. Um, I'll just speak briefly. I think I think you've hit most of the uh, major points here. Yes, um, we recognize that the subsequent plan was developed. It was quite different from the original lighting plan. Uh, frankly, the original lighting plan was rather overkill, and the community would have looked like Gillette Stadium for Monday night football. So uh, we're not upset about the reduction in the amount, total amount of lighting. Uh, you may recall from the last meeting we attended with regard to the curbing, um, some members of the current board uh, visited the site at, at that evening and noted quite clearly that there were some dark corners. Um, yes, the current 2016 plan uh, does address much of that. Um, and here's where I'm going to be uh, really candid with you all and for the, you know, be straightforward about this. I am an architect. Um, I do a lot of work, urban design and planning work as well. Um, so I am familiar with issues of lighting. Um, there was no ISO foot candle drawing prepared for this particular scheme, the latest one. Um, the lighting in the, in the courtyard area, if you will, the green space, the interior lighting. Um, is mostly is 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 adequate. It's mostly decorative, but for a community like Boyd's, it's fine. Um, the major lights, the ones on the primary driveway leading out to Main Street, are quite another matter. The, they're much brighter, but uh, they serve their purpose. Um, where we're lacking in light is the perimeter road and and at the uh, walkway out to the um, right of way leading out to the train station. Um, those are the, it's really the, those 11 fixtures that uh, Owen was referencing um, that remain to be installed. Um, we do understand from our conversations with Owen that there's conduit in place out there. So it shouldn't be a major task to provide that additional lighting. Um, it is sorely needed in some of those locations, especially in the back part of the site. That is the where the roadway runs parallel with the uh, with the railroad right of way, it's pretty dark there, especially between the garage units. Um, there are some other areas, um, uh, such as um, if, uh, uh, Rich, is there any possibility you can get that uh, lighting plan up on the screen? Yeah, I'm I'm getting it right now. So there are, there are some dark areas um, um, and some things I can't make judgments about right now because I don't know exactly what uh, Powerhead is planning for the remaining light fixtures to be installed. Oh, I, oh thank you, Rich. This is a drawing that I <clears throat> made some markup on earlier today and sent to Rich. Um, the gray areas that you see there, those gray patches, those are generally the darkest areas around the perimeter of the site. The, uh, the red dots with a red circle surrounding them, those are the 11 or maybe 12 light, light poles that uh, Owen referred to that have not yet been installed. Um, the one between the two properties labeled 33 and 34 may not even be necessary. Um, the one just a bit further to um, what is there, the Northwest, 
um, at the corner by, adjacent to that uh, handicapped parking space that you can see the symbol for. Um, that one would be important. Uh, the one uh, up at the top left on the picture uh, is the one that's adjacent to where the trail goes off to the uh, commuter rail station. Um, you can see there's a fairly long run uh, staying up there on the back line parallel with the railroad right away. There's a fairly extended blob of gray there between the two lights there. It may be perfectly fine, but uh, the problem with lighting is it lives and dies in the detail. We don't know what the heights are of the proposed light poles, uh, nor do we know what kind of light fixtures and the nature of the output will be. Um, generally, um, I would be looking for a, um, um, a light output that would be ovaloid in shape so that you would get some sort of a um, light distribution that would be more to the sides of the light pole, sides and front. So those two light poles on either side there, you know, they could be perfectly fine, but, um, you know, not only do we not know how high they are, we don't know the distribution pattern, and we don't know what the light output's going to be. The, you know, to put it in simple terms, is it the equivalent of a 60 watt lamp or a 150 watt lamp? I don't know. Um, the lights that are there within the courtyard are probably the equivalent of 60 watt um, bulbs in LED format, which means they draw much less power. Um, and they seem to be, they're adequate for the purpose there, but uh, you know, it's a pretty minimal amount of light and probably preferable for the, for the residents because you don't want a lot of light blowing into your windows. Um, there are a couple missing ones at the uh, points at which pathways come out and meet the street. There are lights, those uh, uh, yellow or gold dots that you see that are, that are mounted on the garage units. Um, where you see just two lights is actually one for each garage unit. The lighting there is actually pretty adequate. Um, the spaces in between the garage units, you know, it gets a little dim. Um, we really need some lighting as you get to the, uh, uh, the northeasterly corner of the site off to the right there. Um, it gets pretty dark in that corner. Now, the places that are causing some concern are, you see on the line there, uh, <clears throat> on the uh, eastern border uh, where the property borders on the old town administration property. Um, <clears throat> there, there's very little light there. There's a proposal to put one light fixture, the one that um, I've indicated with a, uh, there's a blue square around it. Um, that's a suggestion by me that uh, Owen may wanna consider putting that particular light pole on the opposite side of the street where it would help to uh, be in a better position to illuminate that corner condition. Um, it would uh, move it away from the adjacent house there at uh, property number 11, um, and it would cast some light in the direction. There's a staircase that comes down uh, right adjacent to that light pole at, uh, at the property unit number 12. Uh, <clears throat> You know, it's just a comment, but uh, the, the light poles at the top of the stairs. So if you're walking down there at night, you're walking in your own in your own shadow. Uh, placing a light on the opposite side would serve to illuminate the steps to make uh, make it a little easier to, to to see what's going on there. But you notice that whole stretch there on that on that um, easterly border. Um, there's no other lighting in there. The only lighting available are the lights that are on the buildings themselves, the homeowners' buildings. Um, we did have a suggestion um, that Owen was interested in and I think would have worked out just fine, uh, but the board had some reservations about it. Um, the suggestion was that, uh, <clears throat> that the, the outside lights on a number of these houses could be put on um, uh, photo cells or on timers so that in the evenings they could cast some light out there on the roadway, the public area there. Um, that would work in both locations. The lights themselves would be relatively low, so there would be little, little opportunity for light spill that might disturb some of the neighboring properties. Um, but those stretches right now are without any other light source than what comes off of the buildings. And um, I know the concern of the board was that the homeowners um, may not appreciate it because, you know, we individually would be picking up the cost of the electricity. 
course, we're talking about LED lights, uh, generally of the 60 watt category. So they're really quite small. And so, you know, we're talking probably a little more than, you know, five or $10 a year for each of the unit owners uh, involved there. So that would, that would address most of the problem. Um, our remaining concern right now is the lack of information as to what the fixtures are going to be, the light poles, the height of them, and the actual luminaires, the fixtures that'll be on those lights in the other locations, the red dots with the circles around them. And that, that's it for me. If you've got any questions, let me know. I just want to bring it back to the point of the, um, of the 2016 second, the amended plan. Since, since we have the benefit of, of Chris and Mike available tonight and talked about this, I just want to see if the board or anybody from the audience, from the public has any questions relative to the adoption of that plan. We have these gentlemen available, so that would be the time to bring that up because um, we had to start with what was approved anyway. So if, any questions or comments on that from the board? So either everyone feels comfortable that's the plan, fine, or if they don't feel comfortable, they may want to ask a question about it. No, I'm comfortable with that as being the plan. I okay. think um, I think the I think the previous board had had gone through the motions knowing that the the lighting was overkill with Bob McGee's input, and I think that was that was seen on that entrance when we were out there, even at, at night, I think it's adequate. And they put it in as according to the plan that the, that we have now as the secondary plan, if you want to call it that, uh, from the original plan. Um, and I think if, if all the lighting's put in, I think, I think it will address many of those dark areas um, once those lights are put in. Um, it does, it does determine as to what lights go in as the individual just said, but I think according to what was proposed and how they discussed it, I think, I think it would suffice. I okay. think it would be fine. Thank you, David. Does anybody else have any questions or comments relative to that issue? Um, anybody from the, the board or the public? Uh, I agree. I agree with David as well. I don't know what Joe is going to say. I Can agree you state, with your, well. state your name, please? Josephine Kodahi. I agree with David as well. I do think that we have to follow the plan ultimately that was approved. Um, I, it was, you know, that uh, starting with 40Bs, our trial and error in the beginning, and uh, they were gracious enough to uh, join us tonight to uh, let us know more information about that. Um, I also um, uh, have, you know, I understand some of the concerns about moving some of the, the lighting further into the corners, keeping them, but to the corners where they are meant to illuminate versus having them closer to the building. So that makes sense to me too. Thank you, Josephine. Anybody else? Yeah, Joe, I was just, just going to support that, you know, the secondary plan before us is the plan. That's the plan. That, you know, that's our baseline. Please. That's I'm Joe sorry. Sebastiano. Thank you, Joe. Okay. So the, the secondary plan is the baseline for all of this. Yes, I, I wanted to support that. Thank you. Okay. Th th thank you very much. So I, I think that being said, unless somebody from the public has a question or a comment, I, I don't think there's anything being asked of the board this evening. I think it was informational that we had this appointment. Um, we're not, there's nothing before us. My understanding is the developer is building out what they can build and there, there may be discussions between the residents and the developer out there relative to plans or other things. And it seems like in the past there's been some negotiation done out there and uh, it's worked, worked to some level of, a good level of success, I think. Um, so I hope that will continue. If not, if, any, if there's any appeals to the board, we're here. I, but I don't know that there's a, an issue for us to act on this evening. Correct. Okay. I agree. Thank you. Mike and Chris, thank you very much. I appreciate your input. We were hoping you'd have us vote, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was hoping too. All right, <laughs> uh, for the record. <laughs> Best wishes to all the board members, by the way.
Thank, thank, thank you very much. Thank you guys you. are doing a great job. Uh, keep up yes. the good work. Keep up the good work. Take thank care. You. Thank you for coming out. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. So moving on, um, I think our next item on the agenda is town planner updates. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In terms of the uh, three bold items on the top one on the list is the housing choice grant. Um, I received a scope of work from Wilbur and Kern to move to the next step, which was to do additional testing for the feasibility of creating a new waste, wastewater treatment plant for Norfolk Town Center with a leach field behind the Freeman Kennedy School. I, I, I probably mentioned this last meeting in December, if I, I believe, but I did speak to the Conservation Commission where they agreed to issue a license to the town of Norfolk to be able to do some preliminary testing on the conservation property that's behind the Freeman Kennedy School um, because it was at least identified. It is under the care and custody of the Conservation Commission. It's not, it's a predominantly upland property. It's not wetland. Um, there is some wetlands as you get further east on the property, but the one that's abutting near the uh, recreational fields is, is a woodland area. If uh, through the license, we would do some preliminary testing, if it seems to be a viable option for a leach field, um, it would have to go through an, a conversion process in terms of taking it out of under care and custody of the uh, Conservation Commission, which required town meeting vote. And then we have to go through the state legislature as well, which includes a swap of land of the equivalent of three to one to replace what's being removed out of uh, under their care and custody. The reason why the preliminary test is critical is it could define whether it's feasible to use the land as well as the, to the extent the land area would be. Uh, the Conservation Commission did agree to allow the parks and recreation to construct the soccer field on top of the, the land under their care and custody. But to go one step further in terms of this potential use that would that would trigger a conversion. Um, we're, we will be looking at um, the some of the park and recreation land again as well. Uh, and the reason being is if the conservation, excuse me, if the park and rec move forward with this new field on top of the conservation property and had that constructed and operational, we could go back to the, excuse me, the park and recreation land, install the leach field, and then loam and seed and put and restore back the, the uh, use of the, of the green space as recreation or for field space. And then the net result will be a gain of athletic space for park and rec um, because the area that they've at least looked at, there could be, that area could use enhancement in terms of the field. So there's other areas that they have pristine field there with fantastic topsoil, drainable, and that's kind of the, I'll call it the no touch. Um, but there is some area there that could be something where we could figure something out. So anyway, we are um, through uh, the town, no, let me back up, sorry. Um, like I said, the contract with Wilburn and Kern I'm working on getting that proposal. We'll need to go before the select board to review it as well. Um, we did receive $100,000 through the state as part of the American Recovery Plan Act, um, known as ARPA, towards this project, which would be seed money for it. And so hope to get everything lined up to start doing some of the testing in the spring, which was you know, to establish the ground, high groundwater level. Um, as well as reach out to DEP in terms of what the permitting would look like for um, the, the overall system. And then depending upon that, and we turn to the property owners, which they are keeping in touch with us in terms of they are interested in having uh, wastewater uh, you know, potential for development, redevelopment in town center. So that's, that's kind of a high level view where we're at the moment with it. 
Which any, without the testing being done, do you have any sense of, of the high water, the groundwater out there from any other surrounding areas or just any so, test pits? So preliminarily, it looks pretty good. Um, you know, one of the next steps is terms of doing the a mounding analysis to see if, you know, if there's not mounding going on, material blocking the infiltration. And then as part of the testing to see how how it infiltrates in the ground to kind of fit the extent of the the um, you know the, the area as far as the leach field goes. Um, but preliminarily it looks pretty good in that area. So we're optimistic. Um, when they did the study this past summer into the fall, they at least identified potential for 50,000 gallons a day for a groundwater discharge permit. So just give you order magnitude in terms of what kind of flow. Okay. So and then like spring weather brings as far as allowing testing to go on. Yeah. And then uh, just I always like to touch on the funding because that's always important to everybody. <laughs> um, so really the, the viability of this project is really twofold. It's, it's, it's based on betterment through users. And then hopefully the, the big, the big grant piece outside funding. Cause I think, I think I'm well world where everything is going on in the town. And from a financial standpoint, I don't, think there's uh you know an appetite to try to fund this from general taxation so that that's kind of my marching orders that we we're sticking to that until somebody says otherwise but i think that's the safest bet so that viability relies on those two funding sources right thank you. before you move on to your next line item are there any questions or comments from any of the board members or anybody in the public okay being done, go right ahead, Rich. So, Just glad Rich is working on this. That's a good idea. I think it could be a benefit for the town. Thank you. I, I think I, I, I agree, and that's why we we'll continue to work the to work this. Um, good job. In terms of the uh, next item, it's an update relative to Southwood Hospital. I did um, I did do an update a little bit uh, last night before the board of selectmen. So I can just kind of reiterate what I said last night. Just go right ahead. Uh, which was that we're looking to make a slight modification to the scope of work from the planning grant. And the, uh, the change, so it would still have a public, yeah, there will be a planning process involved with it, but one of the, the changes, so the original grant that was submitted, um, the, the analysis point was looking for suitability for high density uh, multifamily housing to help address the, the, the 40 B gap. As, uh, as everybody knows, I think at this point, especially this board, when it comes to 40 B, and obviously Courtney is well versed in this because she's been doing this a long time. Um, if it's rental, you get to count all the units, um, which, uh, you know, and depending on what type of affordable project, as long as you meet the 25%, you're in. But if it's rental, you get them all. So to make measurable gains in terms of getting to that number, um, we're looking at that as an option for the property, along with other uses as part of the redevelopment plan. Um, the, change to this, the change to the scope is to if there's the support from the town is to pursue the 40R as an option, which would um, go to town meeting for a vote, um, with development of design guidelines, would deal with housing types, uh, density, so forth. And then along with that would be an application to the Department of Housing and Community Development to uh, get the district approved. Um, so the reason, to change it is that if that makes sense from everybody and there's consensus on it, at the end of this process, we could have something to, to move forward with. The original scope was really more of a general analysis. It wasn't, that was not potential outcome, literally, which would be a district vote on to by town meeting and then the application DCD. Everything else is on the table. Um, the environmental issues in terms of other uses with the exception of the, just to clarify, not large scale e-commerce. Um, and I, I think we've talked about that several times, um, but I wanna reiterate that point again tonight. 
Um, in terms of these, some of these things are going to be happening simultaneously. There's, um, you know, there's a PIP notice sent out tonight. I think I saw an email from uh, EnviroTrack, the environmental of uh, the LSP, working on behalf of GFI partners, and that. Uh, I'm trying to remember the data. Uh, I'll send along the notice. I'm trying to think what the data is. I can't recall off the top of my head, um, but that that. That pit meeting is going to be occurring shortly, um, but we're going to be doing some things simultaneously. And again, I, just for the record, we know that it's a contaminated site. We know that it needs to be fully assessed. We know it needs to be put in a state that's suitable for residential development. Um, I have confidence, at least working for this town, that the elected officials and the appointed members of different boards will make sure those things are put in place as well as town meeting because town meeting would ultimately have to vote to remove the deed restriction. So while things are moving and we're doing some planning, nothing has been finalized. Um, there's a lot of public involvement yet from a planning perspective with the environmental process, et cetera. So, um, and I just want to be clear about that. Okay, thank you. Could I just add one thing? Go sure. right ahead, Joe. Yeah, I just want to say I'm. I've always said there's got to be at least one area of town that might be acceptable to doing rental type units, because that's like as Courtney and others have pointed out. That would be a way of counting towards you know they all count they're, they're rental units, and you know I'm seeing a number of other towns doing multi unit, um, you know rental units with some mixed other uses going on that seem to be pretty acceptable to the towns that are very close to us. And does seem to be, you know, maybe this area off of 1A really would be the, the right area for this. So I hope that we don't give up on that attempt to try to find a place in Norfolk that would be acceptable to rental units that go right against the count of affordable housing. Yeah. I, I, I agree with you, Joe. I, I agree with you, Joe, very much uh, that some of the mixed use are, give it some character where we're not looking at blocks of, you know, apartment buildings. But I did want to ask you, Richard, uh, if there's any way we can tie this in with the needs of our elderly and our senior citizens that are um, having issues with the current elderly rentals and that somehow we can give back to our community too. Or would that, yeah, would those okay. Exactly. Uh, yes, Josephine, uh, that, that would be part of this process too, to, to, to have some housing choices as well. Yeah. But but that would be, I mean if if age is a factor would they count or would they not count because there is a need here. You can do age restricted affordable housing, but DHCD and the state is getting very crabby about it because most communities to fulfill their 40B obligations went straight to senior housing to avoid doing family housing, and now the state is mad. Okay, so, so you can do it. it you can do it in a 40R, but definitely not a housing choice district. Okay, I understand. I, but, but I, you I, can do it project-based as well because the 40R district theoretically could cover multiple projects. And so the usually you do it in 40R with sub-districts. And so you can say, you know, this is good for apartments. We'll take some townhouses here and some single family and some duplexes over there and we'll call it great. And so that's okay. the flexibility that gives. Plus it comes with the school cost reimbursement. 40, okay. 40R is a great gig for, for the state at the time. That usually the anti 40 R is really more just like fear of the state, but it's a good the reimbursement. It's a better way of going about it okay. if you can get it passed. Maybe we can do something, you know, so to somehow incorporate the elderly housing because they're not not for all of it, but for a portion of it. There's a desperate need for it here in town. Uh, I would suspect that senior housing is a good component of the housing production plan. And so usually you tie one with the other and say, this is a local housing need. Therefore we need it and DHCD relaxes a little bit. Okay. But, um, you, you can definitely do mix. What do you need from us? Is there, are you, if in terms of, are you looking for support or what, what, um, is there anything really, that you do yeah. need? Is there anything that would help? Oh, <laughs> Let me ask that differently. What do you need? <laughs> yeah. I'm, not, I'm, I'm not really asking for anything tonight. Okay. It's just, just more yeah. informative. That's all. Rich, a little bit different, but I, uh, the, I, I don't know whether the state, the state may have just passed the, I don't know what the, what the bill was called, but essentially it creates a, can create a multifamily zone around 
transit around railways, a 50 acre parcel or parcels, 50 acres cumulative has to be identified where you could lose some funding. I don't know enough about it. I, I, That's MBTA communities. Okay. So the mandate for that is that every town with a commuter rail station needs to adopt a multifamily housing district as of right with a minimum density of 15 units an acre. Though in the state's training, they use Norfolk, they use photos of Norfolk as an example of housing at 15 units an acre that would be acceptable. There's nothing to say that you can't draw the district over what you already have. Yeah, but I thought I read some commentary on that. They, were, they, were, they weren't going to just, they weren't going to give you a free pass on that. Oh, no, no, there's some, no, they, it, it's, so right now compliance is required if, with a T station, it's next year, isn't it? I'm getting a pass until 2024. But um, what happens is if you don't adopt the zoning district, you are barred from mass works and housing, what is it, housing choice funding too, and there's one other. And so um, the compliance, this, this is a lot of stick instead of carrot necessarily. Right. So the, so the good news, I guess, I would say in our case, is the rezoning work that we did for the B1 in May meets the qualification because it's 16 units per acre that we did. So we kept it above that minimum. The, uh, at the time when we did this in May, they hadn't put together what that reasonable size district would be. Um, so at the moment, we're under that. However, uh, we'll have to see that Courtney kind of alluded to some ways to kind of <laughs> get, get ourselves up to the 50 acre. Right now, we're under it. So there's, you know, there is a way to get some property that's that's probably not going to be built, but in terms of this, but get us to the minimum. So I I'll see how smart uh, yeah. the, the folks of the state are. So we'll figure that out. But we did, we did adopt the density, and we did adopt the reduction in the parking waiver under the housing choice uh, majority provision at the Maytown meeting. Okay, so I was just kind of wondering if the state may be. If, if we were to kind of be, say, first out of the box to say, hey, we, we're trying to meet you, we're trying to take advantage of this legislation. I know it's not taking advantage of it. It's really like, like Courtney said, it's more the stick than the carrot. Um, yeah. that. But if we came out with a plan, kind of cutting edge, we're first to show it, maybe the state could then say, give us a, you know, look kindly upon us, so to speak, because we're rural, we, we meet all the criteria, and we're, come, we're, not, we're trying to comply with it. We're promoting it. So I don't know if there's any benefit to looking at it from that standpoint rather than waiting down the road where they've got it really hard in stone. Yeah, so in know. terms of, so in terms of uh, May 2nd is the deadline that you know, the MBTA community's got to file in terms of what is their plan of action to meet this requirement. So I know I'll be making the pitch that <laughs> See if we we meet that criteria the way we were, what we've already it's better done. Better to be in front of it, right, than trying to yeah. catch up. Yeah. Oh. Most we'll communities are fighting this, and so I think the early benefit of adoption is very, very limited competition and funding rounds. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, and I saw some cities and towns may just say, you know, we're not interested, but thank you. We'll 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 forego whatever it was we were going to forego. Yeah, and the thing in terms of the town of Norfolk's history, that that's that could be, uh, you know. So, for example, whether, uh, you know, the downtown improvements that you see, the streetscape work, that was that pot of money. You know, it was back, it was PWED back then, but essentially MassWorks is, you know, pot includes PWED. What was PWORKS is now MassWorks. So we did, um, we did utilize that. And then more recently, um, the causeway improvements on Lawrence Street, the, that project was funded with MassWorks money as well. So there is a history in Norfolk in terms of utilizing that money. So it's, it's, it's important. Just, from an overview, you, you don't have to adopt it, but if you don't adopt it, there's certainly there's certain <laughs> funding you're never gonna see. Yeah, and, and by the way, that first item I updated you on, that was kind of the pot I was trying to go for, for that wastewater treatment plant. So it's, uh, it's, it's yeah. kind of- the housing choice money? <laughs> no, no, no. The 
Well, not the house. Yeah, well, the the mass the mass works money. Yeah. Yeah, that well, this house is now. So it's gonna yeah. be okay. <laughs> how, how close? I go to work every are, day and say that. <laughs> how close are we to the fifty acres? We're forty in the B one. Forty. You're at, we're at forty. Yeah. Okay. The, that doesn't include that parcel of the town up behind the. The, t the old town hall, though, does it? That's not B one. That's considered B two, right? Yeah, that's the outer. So here's the here's the the planner terrible irony in this situation. So when we were doing the B one zoning changes, the condominiums that Courtney was referring to was in the presentation meeting house that was part of the housing choice presentation this past week uh, was in the inner core. And because it had already been developed through the 40B, um, we said, look, let's, let's take it out of the inner core. It's already developed. And then town hall was in the inner core. There was a bunch of properties that weren't realistically going to be developed. So we took them out. And as Murphy Law has it, it's kind of come back now um, <laughs> because we had 50 acres. So... Gotcha. I'm going to try to meet, remember that plea in the case that I get into the make? I'm going to have to try to see if I can plead the case and get some sympathy from them. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. To get us a pass. Hey, if they're using, if they're using the development in their presentation, I'm just saying. I know what you're saying. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Uh, Great. And then the last item is just an update in terms of status of projects. I mean, you did well, you heard about Boyd's Crossing. Um, the Lakeland Hills, which is the 40B on Seaconk Street, is uh, they're starting to clear the trees there now. Um, we, they did, are. we did, we uh, did, I think we squared away what it means to. And Owens was very good to get on top of this. One of the contractors tried to warm up the other day, vehicles before 7 a.m. when it was cold, and uh, our equipment, and we got a complaint, and they addressed it right away. That 7 a.m. means 7 a.m. Um, so that we and I assured the resident who contacted me that we went over that like five times during the pre-construction meeting. Um, we do not want to see stuff starting before 7 a.m., warming generators up, you name it. Um, so they're, they're listening and pay attention. Um, and then uh, the enclave is going pretty well. It looks, you know, some more units getting closer to uh, occupancy as well as uh, the village of Norfolk, which is in Norfolk Center. Okay. Thank you. Is there anybody from the public on Zoom that would has any questions or comments or Rich since we have them here tonight? Uh, I do. Please identify yourself. Hi, I'm Sandy Myatt. I'm one of the uh, members of the PIP for Southwood property. And I know that uh, last night, um, Rich and Blythe spoke about the grant and uh, Blythe actually said if the, that the town has not made any hard decisions about what direction we should go. So I'm wondering if eliminating the grant to look at 40B versus 40R, how does that support that statement that they haven't decided what direction to go? <laughs> So in terms of the, I mean, I'll attempt to answer the question in terms of if 40B is the option to go, it, it's there. So it's not from a planning process, they can file a 40B if they want want to. Um, as you know, uh, just to, as of October, uh, excuse me, not my apologies, as of July this year, we will be out of safe harbor. So uh, 
at that point, anybody who wants to do a 40B project could file a 40B project um, in terms of, so it's still always an option. It doesn't require the town to change any zoning at all. It overrides zoning. So it could be an option. Um, it's not to say it's, it's not an option. It's just in terms of multifamily housing, there isn't any zoning bylaw. You know, there's no town meeting involvement in terms of changing the zoning. Um, there's no design guidelines that would be associated that would go as part of that process, uh, nor is there any DHCD in, involvement in terms of approving a 40 r district. So it's still an option. It's not as if it's not. Um, in fact, I think when we get into the planning end of it, there will be comparisons between the benefits of 40R uh, versus 40B for people to understand the, the differences between the two to make that decision. As, as Courtney alluded to, um, the first, first one um, that comes to mind right away is the fact that with uh, a 40R district, um, you're not required to have three bedrooms units as part of the development proposal. With uh, a 40B project, you have to have at least 10% of them, the uh, three bedroom units. Um, you can, uh, as Courtney mentioned as well as part of it, there's an incentive upon creation of a district, uh, a financial incentive payment to the town for the creation of the district um, based on its potential build out. And then there's a, a unit incentive payment that comes from the creation of residential units from a 40 yard district that goes to the town. There is a third, um, I'll call it a, a, an equalizer in terms of potential educational cost from a development as a 40 R, which doesn't exist in 40 B. Uh, in terms of you do the a revenue analysis with a 40 R from mm -hmm. you know, excise tax that comes in, as well as property tax. And if there's a negative delta in terms of educational cost, the 40S program makes the town whole. So as part of this planning process, we're gonna be comparing those things already. So that still could be an option. It's just, it's, it's not, it doesn't require the same amount of work in terms of going that route versus a, a 40R. Uh-huh, I see. So, so if we, um don't look at the contamination at this stage. I think, well, how come we don't look at the contamination in the grant to say that what could we do with this site if it's not viable for residential? So we're good. So in part, we will be looking at, it depends in terms of when I say depends is what we get out of the, the environmental assessment, what kind of data we have as going along through the process. Um, as, as things line up going forward, what we, we have out of it. I mean, we clearly know if it's going to be, I will say this, the initial, so from the housing production plan, it talked about in 2017, high density, uh, try to make a significant dent in our 40B with this property in partnership with the developer. So that was, that was identified in the 2017 plan. We also know, as you know, cause you're very well involved in it, from a contamination standpoint, the standard for somebody to live there is much higher than other uses. So um, that's, that's something that they're gonna have to do to get to that level. Um, if they don't want to, clean it to that level, then, then the residential is, is pieces off the table. It's can't, you know, like we can't, obviously we can't have people build homes if it can't be suitable from an environmental standpoint. So could the grant help us figure out what else we could do with the property or no? This grant- Like a solar field or something like that. Not necessarily this, grant per se, because they could do that now. I mean, so, because solar is allowed there by special permit. So, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if somebody came forward, wanted to do solar there, they could do it. It's just, I don't know if the economics support that. I mean, they could do it today. 
they want. There's there's nothing stopping them. Um, that's allowed there by special permit today. And then everything that's allowed in the C6 zone right now is allowed there through the zoning, which at this time does include, from a housing standpoint, does include age-restricted housing. Um, so this overlay district, which is the 40R, sits on top of it. So everything that's underneath, which is the solar, the 55 and over, you could do that. The commercial that's there today, restaurants, retail, um, uh, bio, bio, uh, biotechnology, that's all, that could all be done. That's not gonna interfere with that all. As Courtney was saying, when you get into the 40R, I guess the best way to describe it in my mind for people is it's, it's really essentially legally be able to spot zone a property. You can, you can 40R, you can drill down to a parcel of land as a 40R district to allow for high density residential. It could be single family, it could be two or three family or multifamily. And then there's minimum prescribed densities associated with that. So that's kind of the unique, it's really, you know, it's not the best way to say it, I guess, but it's really legalized spot zoning. It says that you could zone something that the surrounding area could otherwise not do. So those are and some of the, but again. So the product from this grant is to help you with the application for the 40R? What is the product from the grant? The product is the analysis. So the looking at the resource areas, defining what type housing types, um, the scaling of it, everything that would become part of the, the 40R district um, and start to look at, oh, here's, here's what's suitable for <clears throat> the development to narrow it down, as well as development and design guidelines. So we're gonna be going through a planning process and we're gonna ask, um, when we go before the planning board through the this public process, say here's where it lines up. Does it make sense to go the 40 route route? So do we want to go 40R? If there's a consensus to do that, then it would be to prepare the application, submit it. Well, first to vote at town meeting and then simultaneously uh, make sure the state agrees that it is a suitable 40R site before we get to that point, but. That, so are they gonna look at the requirements for a suitable 40R site, like water, which has always been an issue down there? Yes, yes. Yeah, so all those, all those underlying issues to make this all work is still relevant. So the water still needs to be addressed as part of the concern, the wastewater, all those infrastructure issues are part of it. So this is really, this feeds into the support, the infrastructure to support the development, um, as well as just setting the framework out from the zoning standpoint. All right, thank you. Yep. Thank you. Is there anybody um, else? Tim, uh, we have um, Karen Riley. Karen, go uh, ahead. Hi, thanks, Tim, for letting us speak tonight. Um, uh, so Rich, one thing that I'm really still struggling in my mind, and you mentioned that um, Mr. Bird sent out an email today to confirm the meeting on February 3rd. And Courtney, you asked a moment ago, you know, what you guys can do. I would say, please, please, as a member of the PIP team, follow along with, you know, what's going on as far as the contamination schedule. And in my mind, Rich, I'm still struggling with this planning, this ongoing planning that you keep discussing in conjunction with the contamination. And if I look at Mr. Bird's schedule that's at the bottom of his document today, um, the revised phase three remediation action plan isn't until March of 2025. So we won't even potentially know if this property is even safe for residential housing until then. So how does that line up with this grant and those kind of dates? Thank you. Thank so you. in terms of the, um, I was trying to look at that email. Um, in terms of the, the planning, so the plan, if the, if the 40R district would go, were adopted by the town meeting, then, it would have to go through the permitting process through the town, which would be looking at 
the traffic, the infrastructure, you know, the, the typical things you would expect to see as part of looking at the lighting, um, everything that would be associated with a site plan process through the, through the planning board would have to happen if, this, if the district was in place, which then would lead to a permit. I think we've talked about this before in a couple of other meetings. There was discussion about a developer's agreement that would have certain performance measures in it as well um, to address some of these issues. I think, I think the hard part, and I get it, I, I do appreciate is that they want to, they being GFI or any property owner, as they're looking at a piece of property, want to know, hey, can I, can I develop this property, um, make a return on my money and clean up the site? And so we're trying to help them make that decision with some options. I also don't think that these are mutually exclusive things because a 40 yard, I mean, you're looking for grant funding right now. So that'll take, you know, even if it's a fast one, we're looking at six to nine months for funding than you do procurement. And then it's a two year process to do a 40 yard, generally speaking, because it takes a really long time. And then because you have to do the public side, the zoning side, and then the um, adoption or the DHCD side the application. So it takes a while to do a 40 yard, but moreover, just because something is zoned something doesn't mean that 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 it's safe for, you know, that that the zoning itself doesn't necessarily mean that the land can be used for something. And so it's wise to facilitate, you know, redevelopment scenarios under zoning in the event that it can be used because it makes the property more feasible to clean up. If there is value in the land that is added by adjusting the zoning in the way of like a 40 R that gives them more of a reason to clean the land, and, you know, everybody wins. If, you know, with most things, there's a few things that'll KO land permanently, but most things, you know, event, you know, with enough money can be cleaned. And so if the site is worth enough, it's worth cleaning. So I think it actually makes sense to pursue it now and get it teed up and set up so that there is the opportunity in the event that the financials will work on it. And I would say a 40R is probably a better vehicle because it gives you more options in terms of housing diversity because 40B is pretty narrow. That's my thought. I think it, I think it makes sense to do it now. Just give them it. The 40R is, is there's, as Rich has said, there's so much work that goes into it. It's a technical process. Even doing the design guidelines, it's like eight months. <laughs> so I'm just saying, <laughs> it takes a while. This, it moves at the speed of government like anything else. I think 2025 would be reasonable to hope for for town meeting if a 40R grant went in now. Hmm. So I have a secondary question. How often do these um, 40B and 40R laws change in Massachusetts? <laughs> <laughs> no 40B has been on the books since 1969, and 40R was adopted in what was it, 18? Yeah, but with the same requirements, do, are they changing requirements every few? Or, years? No, no. 40B is 40, 40B has been fought and litigated, but pretty much unchanged. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? No, we don't have anybody. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Any other updates? No, that's it for this evening. Thank thank you very much. That was that was that was good good information, good dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney. <laughs> All right. So moving along, looks like um, on the agenda I have next, we have deliberations. We have do we already do Denham Street? Do we deliver that? Deliberate the Dutton Street already? Was that for tonight? Uh, no. no, you have so you have 228 Dedham Street and you have 31 Campbell Street. Okay. I, I I sent them out for everybody. I think we have one change, Joe had mentioned. We 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 promoted them and we had a great promote them. Right, Joe? I think that was the one. Yeah, it looked like I got a promotion. <laughs> yeah. So well deserved. Yeah, we we got demoted, but in terms of, and just uh, by way of information to the board, I did talk about a little bit with the uh, 
with town council in terms of, you know, we're changing a little bit how we're doing it, where we're drafting at the staff level. We send it out to you to review it. And so under that quote unquote deliberation, this is deliberate. You know, it's, it's, we're just doing what you did before in a different format. It's still the end product. You have a decision, you reviewed it. And so tonight, if you don't have any questions, just vote those two decisions and then we'll uh, have you come in and sign it and then file with the town clerk. Okay, makes sense to me. Is everybody on board with that procedure going forward and tonight? So yes, yes, I agree. I also want to mention though, I think that from our minutes from last meeting, I know in some cases through our deliberations, I know we blessed 31 Campbell, correct? That's correct. Right, so do we need to deliberate anymore? Are we just approving the uh, final write-up? Basically, no, you're, approving. Just, you're approving the final write-up. Correct, okay, good. Which is, a, which is still under the umbrella of deliberation, I believe. Okay, but we did have that formal vote with, you know, we voted, we motioned, seconded, and I think the vote was unanimous. So is, is we just doing it again, or we just have to be specific that we're talking about the final decision, that's all. The final yeah, decision. decision. Okay, good. So we need to make a motion then on like 228 and all right yes. so want to start with 31 campbell i'll go make right a motion you like to yeah i'll make a motion that we accept the decision for 31 campbell street um, could you state it. your name please um, david axberg second any discussion roll call vote okay tim martin aye josephine carday Aye. Chris Metcalf. Aye. Joe Sebastiano. Aye. And David Eckford. Aye. Good. I got everybody, right? Yeah. You got us. Very good. <laughs> Sorry. <sighs> we have a motion on which one are we missing now? Campbell. 31 Campbell. No, we, we I no, just no, that was, that was, we just did 31 two twenty eight Denham Street. Is there a motion on two twenty eight Denham Street? Yeah. All right. This is Joe Sebastiano again. I'll make a motion that we accept the minutes, accept the decision as written for two twenty eight Denham Street. Is there a second? I second it. David Axberg. Roll call vote. Tim Martin. Tim Martin, aye. Chris Metcalf. Chris Metcalf, aye. Josephine Carday. Josephine Cardahi, aye. David Axberg. David Axberg, aye. Joe Sebastiano. Joe Sebastiano, aye. Great. Thank you. We have uh, some minutes to approve. I think, Tim, you said you had some corrections to it. I did. This is on the December 15th minutes. Um, I'll show my face now. <laughs> if I have it here. I had it earlier. Give me one second. I don't know if I have my correct. Elaine, do you have my I remember you corrected it. And oh, here, hold on one second. I think I found it. Yes, on the minutes for this is on the minutes for December 15, 2021. We, we just did some housekeeping on, on kind of the heading and the and the introduction there. Um, but but really from substance, what I went to was um, my, my corrections were under the public hearing of 228 Denham Street. It would have been on was my page two, the, the top of page two. I believe, um, am I right? Oh, I'm sorry, on Campbell Street, I apologize. This is on 31 Campbell Street, page three of the minutes, um, be the third line. Um, I think we redrafted the minutes to read that the foundation has been poured for the shed two years ago in an area not disturbed. The, the 50 foot setback um, was not met and the applicant would like a variance to keep the shed where it is. Lot is triangular within a 200 foot wetland, with a 200 foot wetland, an applicant wanted to set back from road neighbors and wetlands. Forgive me, I'm reading off the original draft. I don't have the changed draft in front of me. 
You're doing, yeah, you're doing good. And th that was really, I believe that was my only comment on the minutes. It was just to clarify on 31 Campbell. It didn't, it didn't change it or anything of substance, just more of a clarification. Did others have a chance to review the December 15, 2020 uh, minutes? And if so, were there any changes or do we want to have a motion on that? We can have a, mo we can have a motion. Okay. So I can make a motion that we accept the minutes for December 15, 2021 with the, I guess the edit that you point out or the clarification you asked be uh, okay. recorded. Could you say your name? Joe Spastiano. Thank you. Is there a second? I second it, David Axberg. Thank you. We'll need another roll call vote. Tim Martin. Tim Martin, aye. Chris Metcalf. Chris Metcalf, aye. Josephine Cardahi. Josephine Cardahi, aye. That was closer, Elaine. Right, Josephine? <laughs> David Axberg. Aye. She got me this time, so it's good. Joe Sebastiano. Joe Sebastiano, aye. Very good. So I think our only open item is the what we heard this evening, the 151 Union Street. If we want to deliberate and vote that this evening, we certainly can. So if you uh, follow in the, the previous format, if you're okay, I can draft you the decision. You have 90 days to make a decision, not suggesting you make, take 90 days because it's a special permit, but you could draft the decision, send it all out to everybody to review it, get their comments back, and you can vote it on uh, February 16th. All right. I think when we make that vote, though, we should just be clear that we're approving the special permit and the decision as written, maybe make a good clarification each time we make that vote. Sure. Yeah, because I, I think that it could make a better motion when we do like 228. I know we wrote the decision. We agreed on you know, on that. I just want to make sure I make the motion a little clearer next time that we're approving not only the special permit and whatever the issue is, the variance or the special permit, but clarification that we're approving both the application's uh, reason as well as the fact that the decision is now written. So just going forward, I think that's being we're under this kind of a revised uh, procedure. I agree. So is it the pleasure of the board? Would the board like to vote tonight and then make a motion that way? Or would the board like to wait? I just want to know, do we have any questions before we let the, go off and have it written? Meaning, do we, I know like I was very happy that Courtney brought up a very good point. I mean, it catches my attention when someone's extending their home that we may have an accessory type situation going on. I know it's still going to be a single family home and the future of what that might hold for that property. But again, under what we can do under this application, we clearly can talk about the setback. But I didn't know if anyone wanted to, you know, talk about that clarification or, because again, it was obviously a first question I had when I first saw this. Yeah, I, 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 I did have one question. Uh, how old is the original house? Mm. I think it's an old structure. I think it's been around a long time. <laughs> okay, <laughs> because we do have that two-family um, bylaw, Correct. which I think it has to be built within a certain year, and the unit has to be above ground. You know, and have you know the existing facilities like kitchen, bath, all these other things, not necessarily separated. I'm just trying to see if in the future somebody could turn that into a few, you know, into a two-family. You know, meet the criteria for that. Well, if they were eligible, they could come before us, but they'd have to make an application for that. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Um, let me look and see. I think, I think yeah. the house goes back to 1800s. I'm checking right now. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I remember correctly. It's an 1800 home. I mean, they were cited for the front yard setback as opposed to use. I mean, it walks and talks like a duck, but what they were cited for and what they're in front of us is is the setback. Right. That, that was the narrow view that I was taking. Is they, They're before us tonight for setback, and, and that's what they've asked for, and that's really what our purview is tonight. So it's not a use issue before us. It's the building department, that's for the building department, but... Not, I not suspect approach. we could reasonably condition approval to, you know, make some, you know, clarification that the, you know, the added area shall not be used as an, you know, accessory unit in the future or something along those lines. So that should it go, 
If I can, I don't, I mean, frankly, I'm cards on the table as a planner. I, anything could be a two family. I don't really care. I really don't care who's in a structure, to be honest with you. People have their aunts live with them, their uncles. If they have their own bathrooms and kitchens, I don't get that fussed about it from a regulatory perspective. It, you know, the site, you know, the citation on this is a little hinky, but I, you know, this seems like something to take a very narrow view on and facilitate as opposed to stand in the way of. And they are going. They are going through the extent of you know updating the sewage system. You know, septic has to be updated to what well, they're doing. Yeah, I mean, there's there's no way they can. Do it. Right. <laughs> we we both know that that's like a thirty thousand dollar septic upgrade at a minimum to facilitate this. Nobody wants to do that for eight hundred square feet. <laughs> so yeah, the, right. uh, the house is eighteen forty one. I mean, had, the house has been updated before. You can tell it's very nice, you know, and uh, you know, and it is a substantial increase in living space that they're putting in there. That's a big number. It mm. is. It yeah. is. I mean, we're, we're not requiring them to. To we're just allowing the, the building to be built according with that setback. We're not necessarily. And, and it's in keeping with what's there already, as far yes. as I'm. Yes. Yes. Okay. Right. Right. You know. It's, yeah. I don't re I don't remember during the meeting if anyone stated what their what their reason was. Is it for family? Yes. Yeah, it is for family. Okay. They have an autistic son who still needs to be kind of living with family, but okay. Okay. trying to get them out. Yes. Yes, I understand. So the reason location to facilitate. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So this goes to my this goes to my point, which you know, even though we're not we don't have to take a vote on it right now, it's just a, the discussing the fact that these things should be in the findings of facts that you know it's a single family home continues to be a single family home. You know, mm -hmm. obviously, you can we can mention the fact that they're doing this because they do have an autistic child that they're trying to provide some, I guess, more you know, we'll call it more separate living quarters for him, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. yep. so, no, I agree. Okay, that, that would be fine. You know. In fact, I think I'll go back. I think that would be accurate. I think that's what the applicant indicated. I agree with you, Joe. Yeah. No, but that's yeah, why I don't mind. Mind. and that's why I normally did in the past. I would take these findings of facts. We kind of discussed it, you know, at the end of the meeting, and it would go into the final write-up. You know, just as because they were facts that we came across in the in the uh, in the application hearing. So, I, I am doing that for you, as opposed oh, yeah. to you. You are. Oh no, you I see. That. No, you're doing it. I saw it. The very the last two write-ups are wonderful. If you want to take it back, that's all no, right. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I like I like proofreading and you know commenting further. I like okay. that. <laughs> all right. That's what. Uh, but in terms of, as I mentioned earlier, so the original, so they had come to the building department last earlier last year, and they weren't comfortable with the communication between the this dwelling, this addition, and the main house is looking at it as a separate dwelling unit. So that's why they had to make that connection with the sunroom, with the doors to feel that they could meet without stretching the bylaw. So that was I specifically- I, I would go as far as calling it a single family home with an in-law as opposed to an accessory. <laughs> But this is a full, that sunroom is still full separation, separate doors. That is so an accessory unit, even under building code. <laughs> so. that was, and, that was, and that was why I was questioning the sunroom a little bit more to kind of get an idea what kind of construction I mean, that would be. I, it, it, you know, like I said, I think this is just an application to facilitate and take a very narrow view of what's in front of us. But uh, I also know that some person in the future in Rich's position is going to pull this decision when the use of the house is subject to question when it is resold maybe in 30 years and the finding that it's a single family home is going to be something that is going to be a very material fact because it's on the line and so I, i'm just cut you know this is just the sort of thing that i know that like i come i find at work and comes back to haunt me pretty frequently so when you make the fighting as to the use and the uses yeah. <laughs> and and how far does the planning board go rich to looking at their entire like we we may approve the setback issue 
but the planning board in the end has to kind of finalize a number of things with them, just like the board of health with the septic system, right? No, they have no, they're not before this the board. Is, this is just really us, the board of health on this the septic and the building department for a permit. Yeah. That's it. Right, and but the building department yeah. still would have to have to critique, you know, the building itself, what they're doing, you know. Something yeah, they no. have, and that's what this, this second reiteration came back. It sounds sure. like they have a plan drawn in the fall and they probably went to the building department for either a permit or, or a cursory look and that was what they came back with. So yeah, um tomorrow tomorrow what I'll do is I'll send you the email. I had I had forwarded to the building department, Jonathan and got back to me. He was okay with this design. In terms yeah, the sun and the sunroom was going to be, I had asked some questions. It's going to be on a foundation. They're adding foundation for it. It sounded like you know, you know, that's what it sounded like. Yeah. Is it conditioned space or did they just put windows in? No, it, you know, it sounds like they have to frame it out, wood frame, he said, right? It was going to be wood frame, that sunroom, and there'd be new foundation, or it has to be on a foundation. Now, whether it's a full port foundation, I don't, I don't know. Again, I suppose outside of, outside of scope. Hmm. Yeah, of course. I mean, and, yeah, it's still, I'm just like, still, it's, the, it's like the first finding you make in any decision, the use of the property, and that's why I'm just like, <laughs> I know. <laughs> We like to ask questions. It's a good project. <laughs> right. Uh, I may need to rent from them someday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now the, the, so the other one you were referring to, the bylaw, that, that literally is a conversion to a two family, um, but they're not, they're not doing that here. Um, it's stretching. I'm not suggesting it's not, but the uh, but, well, that not the recreation area, but the actual you know addition that's along Union Street. That's the open. Uh, is a kitchen? Is a powder room? As he called it, I guess somewhere upstairs there must be a little bit of a bed area. I guess because he said it was yeah. like a one and a half story. So yeah. yeah, I guess it's almost like a studio of some sort if you look at it that way. I mean, they could yeah. have them restrict the cooking facilities so that it's not a full kitchen and like a and you that's one way to kind of scale it back too so that it doesn't walk and talk like a duck as much but again you know then but again you see like a cook but again we're here for the setback yeah yeah, yeah exactly yeah. exactly not a setback right. issue setback. that's an interior yeah. to the structure issue which we don't go to <laughs> <laughs> all right well that's all. thank you for letting us discuss that thank you okay so do we want to wait until the uh, February meeting to, to vote this? Yeah, we'll have a, let the decision be written up. We'll all have a chance to review it. And then, you know, if we're in agreement, we'll agree yeah. that we approve the, uh, we'll, we'll have approved this as well as approve the decision. So I think if the applicant happens to be watching or will be watching on tape, they can get a sense of where the board may go with it. So sure. yep. I want to give folks an opportunity to plan, that's all. Do you, do you want to, uh, so Tyler did his job last, the two decisions you had tonight. I know you kind of had a rotating uh, right process you wanted to try to do is to, to review it and get comments back to me, so. Good point. So, so, for this, for, so for this decision, is there somebody from the board who would like to so-called take the lead, not that you were being alone on it, but take the lead and Maybe we review the first draft of the decision with Rich before the board even sees it and take a pass at it with after he drafts it and sure. or make suggestions to it. Anybody, this is a nice one to start on. Pretty straightforward. I mean, I'll, if it's when it's my turn, I'll take a turn, but if well, I want to stop I, with- you know, I, I, Everyone's different. I, I take a volunteer, so I'd like to get everybody involved at some point. It is a good one. It's a good one to get started on if you haven't done it before. Yeah. Any takers on this one? All right. right. I'll... All right. Good. Well, <laughs> well I have to write my own decisions. That's <laughs> well said, David. She's got hiding under her desk. It's really Was David volunteering? I couldn't quite tell. Either Chris or I. I don't care. Chris, yeah, do you, Chris, my, you want to take this one? My problem is I, I'm out on vacation for about three weeks so uh, which this means i'm going to be external well why don't we why don't we if david's available why don't we have I david am. take the lead I'll on thank you it's no heavy lift it's just a way to be more engaged and you know sure 
Help us yeah. out. Yeah. And Rich, and Rich, are there any more decisions in the process of being written right now? Well, that's it. That's a, all right. Good. So kind of a we're all caught up type of moment. Yep, we're all caught up. Yeah, moment. Right. Yeah. <laughs> in that uh, in that vein, if everybody could um, come into the office at some point, um, I don't know, Rich, maybe even tomorrow. Right. Yeah, yeah right. I can stop by to sign the minutes and whatever decisions are on the table. That'd okay. be great. I'll come by. I'll come by around noon time. That'd be fine. All right. Well, then I'll probably be back. I'll probably be in late in the afternoon. Okay. I'll give you a call. Thank you. Okay. Yep. You're you're in at nine, right? Um, I'm in at eight tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, I can swing by. It's a few minutes okay. away. Great. Yep. All right. I think okay. that's it for this evening. So. I have just one quick question just regarding something different. The actual Southwood Hospital property, even if someone came along and tried to do a solar layout over there, even they would be responsible for a cleanup, right? Not, you know, you know, some level of cleanup, I would imagine. Yeah, so if on a very, very smaller scale, call and wait, which, you know, 15 Lincoln Road, which was the, the junkyard, if you That's, remember. Yeah, it was on the border of Walpole, right? Yeah, they did, right. they, they did a clean up there, right? Right. So um, they finished up the the environmental uh, assessment and remediation and cleanup, and they did a solar project there. And they're they haven't completed it yet. I mean, I will say, solar people have looked at the site, and I don't I don't think it's feasible from an economic standpoint. Yeah, that's the scary it's, part. I mean, it's really, when you say cleanup, it's really just a matter of degree based on the end use. So it's not really like, hey. Yeah, no, right. right. It, it, yeah, it, it, a, a quote unquote cleanup for a solar use may, may not be what you're thinking of as a clean site. It may have an AUL or whatever, but. Oh, um, sure. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I agree. It's very restrictive and things like that, but right. it's not. But, but even cleaning it up for a, sol a solar application, like you said, it might not be a great return on investment. The roadblock's always going to be that cleanup at that site. Yeah, and don't forget there's building that need to be demolished and there's contamination yeah. under the building. There's it's yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's just scary because it's unfortunate that we have all that property that can't be developed. You know, I remember one time there was one talk about having a full development in there with a new water tank in the works, but obviously, you know, so much more to talk about when you just throw that on the table. Mm -hmm. Okay, but again, I want to stall the end of our meeting. I know it's getting late. Okay, no, that's good. Very good. So, is there a meeting? Is a uh, I'll make a motion to close the public hearing. I'll make a motion that we close the hearing. Um, meeting. State your, state your names, please. Joe Sebastiano. For the, I make a motion we close the January nineteenth uh, zoning board of appeals meeting. Uh, is there a second? <laughs> is there a second to the motion? I'll, I'll that, second it, Josephine Cordahi. Any discussion? Roll call vote. Jim Martin. Aye. Josephine Kodahi. Nice. <laughs> nice. Good job. Right, Josephine? <laughs> David <laughs> Axberg. All right. David Axberg. David, you're frozen. No. Nope. Okay. He is frozen. He's frozen. <laughs> Chris Metcalf. Uh, Chris Metcalf, aye. Joe Sebastiano. Joe Sebastiano, aye. David Axberg. Aye. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Okay. 919. Have a good Thank night. You. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.